Well, greetings, future social workers. Welcome back, right? Lecture three, HIPSI two. Quick note, I don't know if any of you realize this, but after you're done with this lecture today, you're officially gonna be halfway through our lectures, right? So, so congratulations, you are approaching the halfway mark. If this was the week, right, this would be hump day. This is hump lecture, right? So congratulations, welcome back. Thank you for sticking with me uh, <clears throat> through the lecture content. So today, as promised, different from last lecture, uh, try not to beat you up emotionally, right? That's the goal with this. We're gonna try to get through this lecture without you crying, without me crying, right? And having any other issues related to the heaviness sometimes that occurs with social work. I made you a promise at the beginning of this course. I promised you that this course will not only continue to waken or you know, open your eyes to some of the macro social problems that we experience in our society, in our world, in our country, right? But I also promised you I would be giving you the tools that you would need as a social worker to beat oppression over the head and to dismantle these oppressive structures, right? So that you would not leave this course feeling hopeless, rather you would leave this course feeling a little empowered, a little more confident to be able to say, there's something that I don't like in society, I'm seeing this, right? And it's wrong, uh, it's not okay. It dehumanizes, it subjugates, it discriminates, right? It marginalizes. And as a result of that though, I know some of the tools, I know some of the theoretical framework, I know some of the strategies I can use to combat right, these issues. I'm gonna give you some of those tools today. That's what we're gonna talk about. Now, if you look at our lesson, let me go ahead and bring up the lesson for today. Uh, the lesson content, you're gonna look at the title of the lesson. And I already know as you read the title, some of you, your eyes are starting to glaze over. You're saying, oh no, another theory class, right? They're gonna throw theory at me. Please, please understand this, right? The focus of our lecture, lecture three today is thinking through theory or thinking theory, right? And the distribution of wealth and power. Those are two items that we're gonna tackle in today's lesson. I do my best to be brief on this because last lesson was a lot. It was not only long, it was a downer, right? And so we're gonna pick it up here with this lesson. Thinking through theory or the distribution of wealth and power and the distribution of wealth and power is what we're gonna be discussing. A lot of times in class, when I was young and I was sitting through my master program and even sometimes in my doctoral program, I was thinking, why do we spend so much time talking about theory? Uh, theory, dare I say, might even be boring. And some people might say, is it even relevant to what we're doing? Um, let me try to offer you a new way of looking at theory today, just a few, okay, as we move through uh, our content. Theory is important. It's important because theory provides a framework for understanding an episode, an event, or a pattern of events that exist in our environment, in the world around us. When we look at something and we can tie it to a theoretical framework, it provides one lens for looking at, at a social issue or a social problem, for example, as we talk about macro social work. Let's take institutional racism that we discussed last week. If we were to look at that through social learning theory, what we would apply, then we realize that racism is a social construct. It is learned, it is acquired, it is taught. And as a result of that, it weaves its way into the institutions within our society. Social learning theory, you just covered it. You made it correct, you made it relevant to life. Well, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna provide you with a snapshot of theories all right, um, just a few, all right, that are relevant for our discussion today. What's important to note is the theories that I covered today are still a very small network of theories that exist within the realm of behavioral sciences and particularly social work. So it's important to understand that if you know these theories, this is good, that's why I'm highlighting them because they're particularly important to our practice as social workers. But please also understand these aren't, an ex this isn't an exhaustive lesson on theoretical framework tied to social work. You will get that in your readings, okay, in all of the text that we're providing, but specifically in your HIPSI 2 text, okay? So please don't walk away thinking these are the only theories associated. I'm highlighting a few today because if I sat here and just talked to you for an hour and rattled off 20 theories, potentially not many of them are gonna stick. But if I highlight a few of them for you and I explain their relevance in everyday life to what they mean, so you can actually see this theory, in life, when you step out of the, away from the computer today, I think that might help us better understand the, the importance of theory when it relates to social work. Now, we're gonna shift our focus from institutional racism to the distribution of wealth and power in our country as a social problem that social workers are tackling or working to tackle and to address. 
um, and to right some of those uh, oppressive practices that exist related to wealth and power in our country. So as you notice, um, uh, we got a lot on the docket today. Do my best to get through this and, 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 and give you some interesting thought and material to think, uh, to consider, right? Uh, I'm going to take a breath and a dash of coffee right now. If you have your coffee, I would highly suggest this is where you, you engage in your caffeination and we will continue on with our next slide, okay? All right, so first off, we're starting off, I know I'm jumping right into it. You're thinking you started right with a slide on theory. You didn't even give us a video or anything, 100% true, right? We're diving into it today, right? This is second semester, right? So welcome. So we're gonna cover first Bandura's social learning theory. Now, before you get worried or you start to get bored, I'm going to make each theoretical framework that I present to you today, I'm going to tie directly to some examples of where you'll see it in real life. Not always through a social problem, but practical examples of how you see this theory manifest in daily life. So let's take social learning theory and let's start with that. Social th learning theory combines three elements to how we as individuals, but also as a society, engage in learning in our behaviors and interactions with one another. In social learning theory, we're taking three characteristics. One, behavior. The second, environmental factors. Factors that are beyond our control that but still influence us every other day. Well, let me say this, not all are beyond our control, but some of them are, okay? But anyway, as we go out and we exchange behaviors and thoughts and expressions within the world, our environmental factors are shaping our experience of our learning of what we perceive of the world. And then we've got personal factors, things that are relevant to us, things that relate to our human experiences and our experiences as a human being, all right? And what social learning theory says is that all of these things are simultaneously contributing to our experience of ourselves in relation to society and us as society and how we interact with individuals. They're constantly push-pulling one another. External factors, you walk into a store, right? And you ask the cashier, you know, for help finding a product. And the cashier is rude to you, right? And says something like, um, I don't have time for you today, right? Or says something really rude, like, I don't have time for this today, right? Uh, why don't you ask someone else? Based on your personal factors, maybe in your life growing up, the last time someone said they don't have time for you meant they don't have time for you based on a personal attribute. They don't want to interact with you because you are a person of color, because you're a woman, because you have a diverse ability, because you're a member of the LGBTQ plus community, whatever the case is, right? And as a result of that, you take that personal experience combined with environmental factors of what someone said, and now you choose your path in terms of your behavior, right? You've been triggered at that point. And so how do you choose to behave? Do you go off on the clerk and say, excuse me, what do you mean by that? Or I'm sorry, I thought you were being paid to do a job. How about you do that with me? Or you say, I'm sorry, what you said right now seemed like there was more to it, right? And that, that potentially really hurt my feelings depending on what you meant. Would you mind explaining what you meant by that? Your behavior, right, is influenced by your environmental factors, your personal learning, and let me throw something out according to social learning theory. If you have a kiddo and then that exchange, your kiddo, is watching that exchange as well. So really quickly, let me give you a couple of practical examples before I unpack social learning theory a little bit more. Right? There's a quote that says, the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. The way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. Wow, that's pretty powerful when you think about that, right? Think about how our parents talk to us individually as children and how that might have shaped the inner voice that we have as adults today. Think about the power that we set it as an example for our children, not only by what we say, but what they see us do. Let me give you some practical examples. We're gonna watch two videos, one a little more uplifting and one that speaks to the reality of when we're not our best selves as human beings, what our children watch and what they end up doing later as a result of that, right? So let's look at this first video, just a fun little video talking about kids imitating their parents, right? So let's check this out. It's not nice to. You can do it, Micah. You can do it, Micah. Imitate your parents. Hmm? What does that mean? It's like copycat. Copy whatever they say. It's 
there something that they always say to I you? I never did that be in my life. Say something that they always You better say. stop being me. You cannot jump on your bed or the sofa. You're breaking the sofa and you're breaking your bed. Make it like Michael Jackson and beat it. Today I met up with this guy named George at the work. Myla, go to bed. Pick up your toys. Pick up the dog's poop. What is called Come down right here. Here's my dad. Okay, let's go to school. Here's my mom. I'm so pretty. <laughs> my mom first. I love you. I love you. I really love you. Lena, I love you. I love you, Gigi. Oh, thank you. Wake up, sweetie. Wake up. Good morning, Z. Good morning, y'all. He's only eight. Okay. What do you want for dinner? Honey, it's time for dinner. Justin. Time for dinner. Eat your dinner, young lady. Eat your dinner. Eat your dinner. Eat your dinner. Eat your dinner. Hey! Eat your dinner again! Eat faster. You're being so slow. We're gonna be late. Use your mouth shut. Brush your teeth. Give me your phone. Get off your tablet. Clara, can you please go get dressed? You got any meetings today? I think so. I work on my computer with photos. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to say something that your mom and dad always says to you. They said, go sleep with the rats. And they said, eat the rats. What is there, a rat in your pocket? <laughs> what are they saying? I have no idea. One time my dad said, eat all your mom when I was a toy. And we got a real toy. Both of us, which was a question of go humans. Wow. Jasmine, go and clean the bathrooms. Go to bed. Do this, do that. You go to your room. Clean up your mess right now. Go clean your room. Alexis, go clean your room up. It's messy. Olivia, go clean your room right now. Ava, clean up your room right now. <laughs> right now. Okay. So I think we get the point of this video, right? Is that what's fascinating to me in that, that, you know, the 17 years of primarily working with children and families is that we often think that children don't have an opinion, that children don't have a voice. There's that old school mentality of children are meant to be seen and not heard. But what's interesting is in this video, and it ties very nicely to social learning theory, is that children distinctively are listening. They're very much listening and absorbing the environment around them. And then the behaviors mirror that later. If you notice what was what was interesting about this video, these children definitely remembered what their, their parents are saying to them on a daily basis. They could rattle it off like that. They first needed a little bit of a of uh, trust to be established, right? That they could actually do this. Some folks said, I don't know what that is. And right, other kiddos were like, I've never done that before, right? But as soon as you gave them the license to be able to do that, they said, I have all kinds of thoughts about what my parents tell me. And some of the kiddos, if you saw was interesting, they were not only parroting back what their parents have said to them, but they're also mimicking the mannerisms of their parents. Some of them were pointing the finger, they were waving their hands, they were doing all of these other things. They were picking up not only on the words that were leaving their parents' mouth, but the tone, the facial expressions, and the body language that was going along with those statements. This is important to understand. I'm gonna tie it into social learning theory in a second. I'd like us to watch one more video. Obviously, we were having fun with this, right? These are kiddos that are having a fun way of poking uh, at their parents, right? And what they discuss. And let's though examine now what kids do when they copy our behavior, if they learn the positive, they also learn the negative, right? So here's a, a nice visual. This is only a minute and 45 seconds, but I think a powerful image of what kids see, do, and learn from us when we are not the best version of ourselves. Let's take a look at this, and then I'm going to tie this in to social learning theory. Sorry about the quality of the That's like fine and real. Sorry about that. It looks like rain again today. Dark clouds gather and fill the sky. Don't know how to talk to you. Just know how to say goodbye.
Okay. Powerful message there, right? I think what's interesting is, as we saw, when we're not our best version of ourselves, um, we as parents, and I know many of you understand this, right? If, if you're parents yourselves, or even if you're not parents, if you have nieces, nephews, cousins, little cousins, things like that, that you take care of or are responsible for from time to time, we can't push the pause button on parenting, right? Uh, and kids don't differentiate, right? If it's someone they love, it's someone they look up to. So just because uh, uh, my kiddo, right, stay, doesn't staying with me, let's say they want to stay at grandma's for a couple of days or something like that, and my, my daughter goes and stay with my grandma, the button on parenting doesn't stop. Learning doesn't stop for that child, right? So not only do are they exposed to how I deal with issues, what I say, what I do, how I respond, um, but then when I leave them with grandma, they're watching grandma's behaviors, and they're watching everyone else's behaviors in that environment. Right. And so we can't push the pause on parenting. Children don't stop learning or just simply say compartmentalize that. Oh, well, you know what? I'm at grandma's house. And so I'm not going to take any lessons learned from grandma. I'm only going to listen to my parents. What's important to understand is, like it said here, children see, children do. Right. Social learning theory is a lot like that. And I'd like to unpack that a little more with you. Let me just find the proper slide. There we are. OK, so. Um, social learning theory. Let's unpack this a little bit more, right? Social learning theory states that people learn from one another via these three ways, observation, imitation, and modeling. Think about that with children. Children observing, children then imitating, like you saw in the first two slides, and then also through modeling. Modeling meaning the example that we set for our children that we're doing, that's what they're doing, and then in turn, those behaviors model norms for others. Children then can actually become models of behavior for other children. Whatever I do in the house, right, my daughter takes to school, well, before COVID, right, it took to school in a classroom environment, the mannerisms, the language, the sound, the body language, all of that, right, is then transferred to other kiddos to pick up and to learn as well. Us as adults do the same thing. Our mannerisms, how we conduct ourselves out in public. When I wear this shirt, right, that says CBU on it, and if I wear that out in public, I am now modeling in someone else's mind what a CBU employee looks like. When I wear a cross, right, out in public, and I choose to declare that I'm a Christian, then people are not only thinking of a Christian in the sense of what the Bible says, but how does this person live up to the lessons of the Bible? This is social learning theory. It is often referred to as a bridge behaviorist um, um, between behaviorist and cognitive learning theories because it encompasses attention, memory, and things like motivation. So here's some things to con consider, like core concepts related to social learning theory, right? people can learn through observation. Sounds like a simple statement, right? But social learning theory cemented this for us that we understand that children in part learn through observation. They are also taught, right? But they also observe and learn about the world around them through that. Internal mental state is essential in the learning process. What we say becomes our child's inner voice. I love you. I love your laugh. Right? Your smile is so beautiful. You're such a hard worker. You're so kind to other children. Thank you. I'm sorry. Right? Imagine the power of children growing up and what their inner voice comes like uh, becomes when we speak to them in such a way. Now consider, right? Shut up. Sit down. Stop talking. You're annoying. You get on my nerves. You're so dumb. Right? Consider the inner voice that comes from this type of language. Learning does not necessarily lead to a change in behavior. So this is important to understand. Learning does not necessarily lead to a change in behavior. Why is that? A teacher can tell me using bad names is wrong and it's hurtful to others. But when I get home and the main modality is hurtful words that are expressed to me or expressed to my mom, right? Because my dad is using these words towards my mom. You can, the teacher can tell me that this is bad, but this is my norm. This is all I ever know. So what am I supposed to do to change my behavior? I don't have another model of behavior to follow. This is social learning theory. Even if in my gut, I think this is wrong. I don't agree with what my dad's doing to my mom, but what else could be done? I don't know what could be done. I haven't been taught anything else. 
So just because I learned that it's bad doesn't mean that I can automatically then change my behavior. Oh, well, you know, intimate partner violence is bad. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and change my behavior to what? We haven't learned that yet. This is why social learning theory is important. Okay. So there are conditions um, that need to be present in order to have effective modeling, in order to be an example to share with others, all right, to change behavior that has been learned through social learning. Okay, attention is one. We have to have the attention of the individuals that we're working with. Retention is another, having the ability to remember what you have been taught from day to day. This is why I'm not giving you 40 theories in an hour to discuss. I'm giving you like three, okay? Because I'd rather spend time digging into it, having you retain the information on three and learning the others as you move along through the course, rather than throwing everything at you and saying, now memorize all of it right now. Reproduction, the ability to be able to reproduce what you've learned out in the real world to do it, okay? And then finally, the motivation to have a good reason why to imitate, right? Uh, what, and honestly, this is why a lot of human beings, we look at life is, well, if I were to behave this way, what's in it for me? What is the benefit, right, to that? And so uh, let me move through this then, right? Um, there are three means of affecting people's behavior according to learning theory, okay? One is respondent conditioning. This is the elicitation of behavior in response to a specific stimulus. So like, for example, we can learn through respondent conditioning when someone yells fire or right, another group's run, right? That's, that's an, uh, a respondent of a respondent conditioning. We've been conditioned to respond in that moment, right? Uh, soldiers are often trained, right, in boot camp, right, to... Uh, learn responding conditioning. When there's gunfire, you get down, you find cover, right? These are things that you automatically do when that moment happens. Modeling is we can learn through observing others. Let's take boot camp and let's go with that basic training because it's a good example, right? You ask someone that served in the military, how did you get to the mess hall in the military, the food, the cafeteria, where you go eat, right? How did you do that on your first day of basic training? They'll think back and they'll be like, um, I don't know, like, well, did you, how did you learn where the mess hall is? Did you never eat, you know, the entire time you were in the military? And they said, no, I ate, I ate when I was there. I said, how did you know where to go at mealtime? And many of them will say, I followed the crowd. Everyone else was going there. Remember the story of the monkeys and the ladder and the bananas at the top of the ladder at the beginning of the first lecture, right? This is a notion of observing others. We behave a certain way because we've watched what everyone else is doing. I'm hungry. Everyone else is hungry. They're going somewhere where there's food. I learn where the mess hall is very quickly because I followed everyone else to get there. I just did it because everyone else was doing it, okay? That's one mode of learning theory and changing behavior, affecting people's behavior. And the third is operant conditioning, right? So, this is a type of learning which behaviors are changed primarily by regulating the consequences that follow them. Does this sound familiar? So if you do something good, I give you a positive reinforcement. If you do something bad, I negatively reinforce that behavior. Think about this for a second, right? Think about this is the primary mode of how we learn in society through our systems, okay? Think about this. You follow the law, guess what? You don't get to go to jail. Right? You don't get pulled over. That's what we think in our mind. But if you speed and you drive a little fast, you get a massive ticket, right? If you commit a crime, you get thrown in prison or jail for a very long period of time, right? If you're labeled as a felon, now you are punished because you cannot um, uh, acquire certain jobs, right? Uh, you cannot apply for certain assistance in housing. You may not vote. You may not legally purchase or possess a firearm. You cannot access student loans under federal government funding, right? These are all punishing things meant to change your behavior. It's meant to say, wow, rather than pulling the trigger and spending the rest of my life in prison, I don't wanna do that. So instead I'm gonna do something else. This is the notion of operant conditioning. The problem with this though, is that when we're talking about macro social work and a system is geared specifically to reward others and punish others, all right, under specific influences such as race or power or wealth, this learning theory becomes distorted, okay? So there's this theory of also what's called social exchange in where social behavior, our day-to-day -day interactions, what we do with one another is an essential exchange of goods, which sometimes are material goods, okay? Such as, you know, things like food, 
shelter, money, things like that. Okay. Um, but also, it's also a notion of it has this lens, uh, this influence of, um, of uh, power at play. Okay. So in the United States, and I'm going to explain this in our distribution of wealth and power, is that our interactions, we don't just simply have relationships in our life because we like people. The fact of the matter is that people have networks around them as a means of support when they need something. And what happens with that? There's a common saying, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? And what this means is if you can do me a favor with the resources, time, energy that you have, what I can do is I can hook you up in areas where I have time, resources, and expertise and something else. The theory basically means that there's an exchange of material goods, wealth, power, things like that, um, in our relationships in everyday life. It's not simply that we have relationships with people because we're warm and fuzzy, all right? There's a deeper connection to that. Um, let me move through this really quick. So um, yeah, George Hammonds talks about this notion of perspective where people will do things that are rewarding, okay? Um, and this is a philo philosophical perspective as well that people do things Ultimately, there's no altruistic anything that everything that we do, this is one mode of philosophy, right? That everything that we do ultimately is self-serving to our own good. Um, the most similar uh, situation is one from the past, the more likely actions that were rewarded will be performed. So what happens is, is that if something worked for us in the past and we were able to benefit from it, we're probably going to do that behavior again. Let me give you an example of that in real day life so that you can understand this, right? I worked with children who had been severely abused and neglected throughout their entire childhood. And as a result of things that going on in the family dynamic, safety and things like that, some of these children have been removed from their homes and placed into residential settings, used to be formally, formally uh, referred to as group homes. Okay, now they're um, short-term residential treatment placements, okay? Um, when these kids came to us and we're working with them in the homes, oftentimes I'd hear staff describe the kiddos as being resistant, as being rude, as being defiant, as being manipulative is one in particular. I always kind of cringed when I heard that talk going on because while the behavior certainly can be perceived as rude and as a power struggle, engaging in power struggles or defiance or manipulative, while that, that may appear to be on the surface, what I would challenge folks to consider is, is that they're behaving away because according to social learning theory, they have learned that this behavior gets their needs met. Uh, an amazing trainer that I once had the pleasure of learning from Patricia Miles had said bad behavior is the result of an unmet need. Kids had to learn how to be oppositional because they didn't know if the person they were interacting with was going to harm them, abuse them, right? Physically, sexually, emotionally. Children had to learn how to manipulate because when there were four other siblings in the home and no one was getting fed, they had to draw attention to themselves to get their needs met in order for their stomach to be full. If they wanted to feed the rest of the kids in the home, they needed to manipulate others in order to get enough food to feed all of the children in the home. These behaviors, while they don't necessarily transfer over to everyday life for us to be successful as human beings, like in our circles, was successful for them in order for them to be able to have their needs met in their environment. So Hammonds talks about perspective here, all right, about, look, if this behavior of manipulating worked for me as a kid, why wouldn't I keep doing it, right? This is the notion of social learning. So according to social exchange theory, humans weigh the costs against the benefits while forming relationships, right? It's, it's, it's sad to say, but when we look at in a relationship, right, of, of just a, not, and I'm not talking about a romantic relationship, I'm talking about just a friendship or bringing someone into your network, human beings often look at, well, they seem like a really cool person and, and then that and follows, and, you know, they still know a few people over in HR at some agencies I'd like to work with, right? Maybe, maybe I should stay in touch with that professor. That's okay, right? That's what we're here for. We wanna make sure you get good jobs when you leave, but we also have to understand that there's a social exchange that takes place in that. 
is that in the process of learning, you're also searching for opportunities for employment. So at that time, then we understand that part of our relationship, right, as instructor and student is also to make sure you not only learn from us, but have opportunities to, to go out and use all of that you've learned in an, on a, a career later, right? And so when we talk about social exchange theory in general, what we're really talking about, again, to go back to this macro perspective, is focusing on the interaction or behaviors of two or more individuals. We're looking at groups, remember, not just individuals, based on the work of both learning and decision-making theory, okay? The core idea is two people interact with each other, they exchange benefits and cost. There is a mutuality design to this, right? So you think, so some of you, like if you're dreading my class, right? You think to yourself, oh my gosh, like this class is going to suck, right? Dr. Mako is so mean. And you think, but I need this class in order to finish my MSW program. So the juice is worth the squeeze, right? If I can make it through Dr. Mexico's class, I can get these credits and these credits will add towards my degree. And ultimately that's what I want. It's an exchange, right? An interaction of benefits and costs. The benefit to you completing this class is greater than the cost of putting up with me for 13 weeks, right? I know you all don't all feel that way. Hopefully you don't all feel that way, but just saying there's a reality to that, right? And so that's important to understand. Let me throw this out really quickly then, and this is going to move us into this social exchange, highlight this social exchange thought, okay? And again, remember I told you any theoretical stuff, like when I talk about social exchange theory, I'm going to give you in a real life example so you can kind of see how it plays out in the real world. Think about this for a quick second. Why are we nice to people? I'd like you just to consider that for a moment. Think about in your mind why you are nice to other people. And then consider in your mind why someone else, why other people are nice to other people. Think about that for a second. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna examine some common things, some common explanations of why people are nice to one another. And I'm gonna kind of highlight how this is a social exchange based on the philosophy of where we're coming from with this, okay? So go ahead and mull it over. Okay, people are nice to people, why? Some people will say I'm nice to others because it's just the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Other people will say, well, people are nice to people because people are innately good. We're innately good. Now I'm not saying that all of you agree with this, right? Some of you may, may actually, some of these might jump out at you as yeah, that's why I'm nice to someone else, okay? Don't feel guilty or whatever. These are all tied to physiological, I'm sorry, um, philosophical reasons why we're nice to people. So let's unpack them a little more. Some people might say that uh, I'm nice to people because people are cowards and are afraid of others being mean to them. So they're nice to them first. If I'm nice to you first, all right, I don't want you to be mean to me. I'm worried about that. Let me be nice to you so you're nice to me back, okay? People may realize they need other people for their survival. So they establish ties. Look, I'm gonna be nice to you because um, you drive a nice car, you got a nice house. You invite me over for barbecues. Ooh, I love when you invite me over for barbecues in the summer because then I get to swim in your pool, right? And so they're saying, look, I need something from you. Having fr Being friends with you has its benefits, right? Let's keep this good thing going. That's why some people may be nice to others. Doing good makes me happy. Right? I just like being nice to people because when I do, I feel better about myself. It makes me happy. Some people may say, well, look, I'm being nice to people because they're my brother and sister, not meaning literally, but that is my brother and sister in humanity, right? They're another human being. And I think we should treat all human beings the way we want to be treated. All right. So, so they're my brother and sister. Now let's unpack this for a second, right? All of these are reference to social exchange theory because there all is something in it for one or both sides of the spectrum here in this relationship. Let's unpack these a little bit more. It's the right thing to do. This is tied to a uh, form of ethics called um, teleology, okay? Now, teleology is this notion that the, um, the question of, does the ends justify the means? Do we do what is good or what is right, okay? And now I'm not gonna go into um, teleological ethics, okay, on this, it's, it's a whole lesson in and of itself, but the major principle to this is if I'm doing harm in order to eventually do what is right, even if that means the means is not great, does that justify it, right? Or should I do what's good, even if what is good isn't always right for everyone else? That's the question, okay? 
Uh, Jean Jacques Rousseau had put people are innately good. This was a philosophical um, concept, a belief. Thomas Hobbes believed that people are cowards, right? And that conflict is what drives relationships, not the innate belief that people are good, but the innate belief that people will go off the rails if we don't uh, have some social order involved, right? Egoism is the belief that people realize that they need other people for their survival. This is a notion of philosophical uh, understanding of the world around us. Eudonism is tied to uh, doing good makes me happy. It's in a very loose sense without diving into the complete uh, philosophy of Eudonism is the belief that if it feels good, do it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you do it at other people's cost. Some people say, oh, wow, that sounds really great. Like, I want to, I want to, learn more about Eudonism. It doesn't mean that if doing crack every single day means that you should do it because it makes you happy. It, there's limits to it, okay? But in basic sense, what it means is, is that if it makes you feel good and it also benefits others, do it, okay? Is the essential thing before that. And then when we use words like altruism, spirituality, religion, okay, that drive this notion that we are all somehow connected and we have a responsibility to value the dignity of one another, then we're good to one another for that. So some of you have heard me teach on the notion of love, right? And agape um, of the, the meaning of the purest sense of love in the Greek language. And that ultimately, like what Dr. King had said, we love people not because we like them, but we love people because God loves them. This would fall into that rationale of a religious or spiritual connection to why we're nice to others. Do you see though how all of this would fall under social exchange theory? Because ultimately we're believing that we're treating people a certain way be driving an exchange, whether it's based on ethics, based on the belief of people being good, bad, based on ourselves, or based on what we do to benefit others, all of it falls under social exchange theory because we're hoping that there's a benefit that comes from this. Maybe it's in this type of time, maybe it's not. Maybe it's in social order, maybe it's individual, okay? So just a couple of examples of that. I want to throw out a term that you should become familiar with as social workers when dealing with macro issues related to social problems. And that's that notion of social capital, social capital. Now, many of you have heard of capital, like capital gains, like monetary gains, currency, right? Social capital is kind of like that. Social capital is referring to the notion that in social exchange theory, we're not only exchanging physical money, right? That sometimes you can have an interaction with someone where no money is involved, yet each of you benefit from that interaction due to social capital. Social capital um, basically is talking about an exchange of things like power, uh, prestige, notoriety, expertise um, as a result. So let me give you an example of social capital. Social capital, is sometimes measured in trust. If I work for an employer and my boss every single day and I am dependable and I am reliable and I am agreeable, right? And I turn in my work of high quality all the time and suddenly something awful happens in my life. God forbid someone very close to me dies. And as a result of that, I am struggling emotionally and I am not myself and I am cranky and I am rude and suddenly I'm start showing up late to work and my work looks like it's dipped in quality. Social capital means that my boss, instead of firing me, may come to me and ask the question, Dr. Mako, what's going on? Are you okay? Right? Like you're not yourself and I know this work isn't like you, right? So rather than write you up or fire you because this is so out of the norm, you've earned trust with me, earned social capital for me to ask the question, are you okay? Is there anything we can do for you? That's social capital. Social capital would be is getting to know another amazing faculty at another institution that writes a really brilliant book. I've got a number of these faculty in my mind where I've been really influenced by the work that they're doing. And I'm saying, hey, I find your work fascinating. If you were to come out and maybe speak to my students, right? Um, is there anything I can help you out with either through research or something? And they may say, you know what? Can you come out and speak for my students on A, B, and C? Because that's your area of expertise. Social capital is an exchange. We didn't pay each other. We didn't give each other any money for coming out and speaking to each other's students, but we both were able to say that we brought in this big name for one another to speak with. 
Let's talk in reality, right? I'm gonna be completely real with you like I always am in my lectures and give you real examples of social capital. Um, when some of you learned that, that we were coming, that, that Father Greg Boyle was coming out, right? For the lesson. And then when our Dean talked about, it was my job to coordinate with um, Father Greg Boyle. And later it came out that Father Greg and I have, you know, talked and he's a friend of our families, my, my dad in particular. Some of you thought to yourself, oh, wow, Dr. Mayko knows Father Greg Boyle. Now we're not best friends, right? Like we don't hang out all the time at each other's houses and all of that, but he's a strong mentor within my families, particularly within my father's spiritual development. He's been a role model to my father, to me, to our family issues that we've had regarding some family issues of incarceration in the past. He has become a loved and valued member of our social network. And so rather than see the exchanges, oh, that's so cool. They have a friendship. Some of you have said, may have thought, oh, wow, you know, um, this person moved up a couple points because of who they know in my book. That's social capital, okay? That's the notion of that. It's important to understand this because social capital is at play every single day in our lives. Now, some of you, if you've taken my classes before in undergrad while you were at CBU, you know that I teach a class called social stratification, right? And I teach this class because it's important to understand that in the United States, as with any other um, society, individuals are what we call stratified. Stratified means put into degrees of high and low ranking based on several social factors. In our country, the United States, individuals are stratified primarily in three major arenas, but also in additional ones, as we'll see here. People are, made, are majority in the majority of our country stratified by race stratified by income or wealth, okay? We'll talk about being the difference between rich and wealthy and also by gender. These are our three major areas that we consider. But other stratification includes that if you're more educated, you're higher in the totem pole. If you have more income, you're higher in the totem pole. You are treated differently if you are a janitor or if you're a professor. I'm not saying that that's right. I'm saying that's the reality of what exists in our country, right? If you come from a family of wealth and power of lineage, right? If you're just Joe Smith that lives on the street and you're not famous, you're not a filmmaker, you're not a, an athlete, you're not an entertainer, you're not something like that, and you're just a person, you're held in different stratification than the Kardashian family, right? There's a different name, power, prestige that comes with that name, that family membership, right? And so what's important to understand is, is that as we move through cultural capital, Cultural, um, um, social capital changes with each interaction we're in. Let me give you one more brief example of that, okay? Let me see, yeah. Let me give you one more example and then we're gonna move on to our distribution of wealth and power because I wanna pay attention to the time. So um, social capital changes depending on the situation you're in. Here's something to understand with that, right? I may, depending on where we are, um, in our environment. Let's say I walk into a certain social setting, right? Um, if I walk into, I'm trying to think of, let's say a common, okay, I shop at Cardenas, okay, a lot, right? I love Cardenas. If some of you know, like Superior or like other stores like that, I shop at Cardenas because they have amazing produce. They have every cut of meat that I'm looking for. I like to sneak some chicharrones, you know, when I show up and my wife's like, did you eat chicharrones on the way home? And I'm like, Maybe, maybe I chicharrones and some salsa too, whatever the case is, but I shop there a lot, right? Now, Cardenas, if you notice, depending on, on the majority of you, if you shop at a store like this, a primary, more like a Latino store based off of, is that most Cardenas are located in areas that are considered lower income. Like I go to mine on Mount Vernon in Colton. That's where I go. It's considered a rougher neighborhood, primarily a neighborhood composed of people of color, both Latinos, African-Americans. There is actually a small Filipino population and Middle Eastern in the particular pocket of the neighborhood that I go to there. And therefore also considered low income and low educated, okay? Let me give you this example of social capital. If I were to walk into under the guidelines of stratification in our country, when I walk into Cardenas, okay, the community is making assumptions about me and I am making assumptions, assumptions about the community because of the social setting that we're in. Some individuals may look at me and if I'm wearing a Cal Baptist shirt, okay, and I go to Cardenas, some individuals are going to look at me and make a judgment. They're going to say, 
oh, he's a college prep boy. He's book smart. I bet he probably doesn't speak good Spanish. He's probably here because he needed something for a recipe that he doesn't make all the time. And he doesn't know what half the stuff in this store is. He's probably rich. He probably drives a nice car. He probably blah, blah, blah. And it goes on and on. Likewise, I could make an assumption that the majority of people in that store maybe didn't go to college. Maybe there are some that are, are citizens. Maybe there are some that are not. Maybe primarily they speak Spanish. Maybe I'm making an assumption that the majority of those Latinos may come from Mexico or Guatemala or whatever the case is. In either cases, both sides would be wrong and both sides would be right in certain respects. Now pluck me out of Cardenas in Colton on Mount Vernon Avenue and pop me into a wealthy fundraising event in Riverside where let's say people like the mayor, bank owners, wealthy business owners, right? Um, are all present. Where the majority of those individuals might be Caucasian. They might be over 50 or 60 years old. They are wealthy. They are driving Teslas, not Mazdas, right? They own multiple businesses and they vacation in homes that they own in other states and or countries. Social capital is exchanged now at a very different rate. My chips on what I can buy in and negotiating relationships with others changes based on the environment I'm in, okay? I don't mean to beat this over the head, but the point that I want you to understand when we're talking about social capital and social exchange theory and social learning theory is that relationships, sometimes we look at relationships and you ask someone, they wanna be altruistic, and you wanna ask them about their relationships in the community and they'll say, this is just a great group of people. True, but there's also assets, resources, opportunities tied to your relationships with others. As a social worker, when you step into an environment and you're starting to change oppressive systems, when you're starting to challenge laws, legislation, policy, and you need to rally the community around you, you have to understand that the community has its own social capital, social relationships, and social learning has taken place as a result of that community's historical experience. When I walk into Casablanca in Riverside and I say that I am part Mexican, all right, they're going to say what generation Mexican, because you're going to have a combination of Latinos or Chicanos, okay, that exist in Casablanca, that their experience will be very different from mine based on the generations in which they were raised. Okay, and so that's a social learning theory at place that I can't assume that just because I'm Mexican, I know Casablanca's experience. Okay, that's not the case. All right, so just something to think about. I'd like us to move on to then the distribution of wealth and power because this notion of social exchange, social exchange, uh, social learning theory, and so, uh, social capital are going to play out in the next half of our lesson. And I promise I'm going to try to get us out of this kind of quickly. Okay, let me start with our lesson with a quote from Plato. Plato had said, any city, however small, is in fact divided into two. One, the city of the poor, the other of the rich. These are at war with one another. Um, it's important to understand that as I push us to consider the distribution of power and wealth in the United States, I'm asking us not to get too caught up, if you will, to allow some flexibility, some forgiveness of ourselves to let go of some of the conditioning that we've been taught of how we earn a living here in this country. The fact of the matter is, is, as wonderful as this country is to live in, and I, I'm so blessed and grateful to live here every single day, the fact of the matter is we have a lot of work to do as social workers to see to the uh, just distribution of wealth and power in this country. But some people get threatened by these conversations because they say when you're challenging the distribution of wealth and power, the concept of meritocracy in this country, you're challenging America, okay? I would like us to step away from that for a second. What we've learned from Plato's quote here is since time immemorial, there have been rich and poor and it's been in conflict with one another. That the distribution of wealth, power and resources in societies has not always been just. And just because we critique the distribution of wealth and power in a society doesn't mean that we're bad Americans. It doesn't mean that we're bad people, right? It just means that we see some gaps in our society which need to be changed for the better. All right, and that's what we're gonna discuss in the following slides. So I'd like just to do a quick activity for fun. I'd like you to complete the following phrases, right? So of course you're not getting a grade on this. I don't know if you're saying them back, but I would like you to look at a few, uh, a few of these phrases. They're going to seem familiar to you. I wanna see if you can complete the phrases, fill in the blank, all right, with what I'm gonna share next. Let's take one for an example. We hold these truths to be self-evident 
that all men are created, whatever you say, okay, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of. So many of you said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, right? And that they were, you are entitled to unalienable rights among these, these rights uh, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Is what you had, many of you had said. This is a familiar phrase to you, right? When life gets tough, you just pick yourself up by your and keep going. If you said bootstraps, that would be familiar, right? When life hands you lemons, you, many of you said, would make lemonade, right? You would make lemonade. Uh, the correct answer is not make um, tequila sours, right? Although many of you may say <laughs> that's one thing you'd like to do. I'm going to say for this lesson, we're making lemonade, not tequila sours, right? Uh, America is the land of the free, right, is what many of you might have said. In this country, I can be whatever I work to be. This is the entire premise of the, and if you said American dream, right, you would be correct. These phrases are really powerful. They're burned into our image. Many of you went through these phrases, you rattled them off and you didn't even think about where they came from because you were taught these phrases at a very young age. You were taught these things in kindergarten, throughout high school, throughout your entire life and they're reinforced. All of these phrases are powerful because they're tied to one, our national identity, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, right? And they're also held to a concept of meritocracy. When life gets tough, you suck it up and you pick yourself up by your bootstraps. When life hands you lemons, guess what? You turn those lemons into lemonade. You are the master of your own circumstances. You can be what you want to be. This is the notion of a meritocracy. Take a deep breath. I'm going to challenge us a little bit to look at meritocracy different based on what we see from a macro lens, 30,000 foot level, the red pill of the distribution of wealth and power in this country. Think about for a quick second, what is your American dream? Think about your American dream for you and your family. Now, obviously you're not gonna gather into groups, but think about what is your American dream? What do you want to accomplish in your lifetime, right? Um, and maybe that's, that's home ownership or maybe a bigger home if you own one already, or maybe you wanna to add to your home or maybe you wanna drive a certain car. Maybe you wanna have a certain job. Maybe you wanna live in a certain area. Maybe you wanna vacation to a certain place. Think about your American dream. Think about that for you. All right. Now, I'd like you to consider then. In our country, from a young age, with these phrases, we are taught that we live in a meritocracy, that the United States is a capitalist nation that and a democratic society in which we are built to be what we want to be. Success in a meritocracy is tied to your work ethic and achievement. If you work hard, you are rewarded. If you bust your hump, you work longer hours, you get more money. And when you get more money, you buy what you want. You move into a neighborhood you want. You drive a car that you want, ah, yada, 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 right? Now, this notion is also referred to as individualism. My success, my, my American dream is what I want it to be. Okay, so with this notion of individualism, success is dependent upon the inherent value and worth of the individual. Hang with me for a second here, okay? I'm going to make a statement about that in a second. Some of you are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, Dr. Mako. You're saying that success is built on the inherent value of an individual. What does that have to do with working hard? Follow me for a second, I'm going to get there, okay? So societal factors, influences, and systems don't matter. Okay, They don't matter. Because ultimately in a meritocracy, in, under individualism, if you want it, you can get it, all right? It doesn't matter how hard life is outside of that. This is a meritocracy. This is America. If you want it, you're going to get it. So I can be what I want to be, okay? So in our country, this is where I'm going with this, tied to the inherent value of an individual. If someone's rich, we think to themselves, wow, or to ourselves, they must be hardworking. They are successful. They are focused. They are disciplined. They are intelligent and they are deserving of that wealth. Again, not always untrue, right? I have a lot of friends that are very well off, like I'm talking well off, right? And I would say that they're hard work working. I would say that they're definitely intelligent and they've got a strong work ethic. But then there's another side to meritocracy that we have to be careful with. 
Because then when we're saying that if you're poor, and this exists in our society, what we call shaming the poor, poor shaming, is that if you're poor, it's just simply a matter of you're, you must be lazy. You're not willing to put in the hours. Or maybe you're sick or disabled. There's a reason, there's a flaw with you physically to why you don't, um, you cannot work hard enough to achieve your American dream. Maybe you're undeserving. Maybe you don't deserve to have that money because you're not willing to work for it or you did something to deserve you being in your current state. This is the flaw of merit meritocracy in our country because when we understand from a 30,000 foot level how wealth and power is distributed in our country, we will realize that yes, there is a factor of social mobility which will allow you to a small degree to move up in society based on um, uh, wealth uh, or resources, but it's very limited in the glass ceiling. In fact, what we see is it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the poorest of the poor to ever move up to a position of wealth within two or three or four even generations um, within uh, a family structure. And so oftentimes in our country, I'm gonna give you examples of that in the following slides. In our country, we talk about the notion of rich and wealthy. We talk about the difference here. Sorry, let me move my face for a second so you can see that. The, dif the difference between being rich and being wealthy. Those are two very different things. Sometimes our goal when we come from a lower income background, when like, so for example, when my family, uh, I'm the product of immigrants on both sides of my family, right? So both grandparents came here and their goal was maybe to be rich. That's what they thought their American dream would be, or at least for their children to be rich. And then their children wanted wealth, right? There's a difference between them. Rich means you have a high income, means, means you're making a lot of money, okay? But rich means that we spend more time spending than saving. We're just so excited to have that massive paycheck, to have that, that um, huge bank account that we wanna go out and we wanna buy the car. We wanna buy the big house. We wanna fly on a jet. We wanna do all these things. And so we're racking up all of these expenses, even though we've got a lot of money coming in. So assets typically, even for the rich are, are accrued via loans, okay? So just because I have a fat bank account, let's say, and I don't, this is not really me, right? But let's just say I did have 500,000 sitting in the bank, okay? I still would want maybe a, what if I wanna go out and spend $160,000 on a Ferrari? Well, that's gonna make a big dent out of my 500,000. On top of that, if I'm rich, I have that money now. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean I'm gonna have it the next day. And so the problem is, is that when I look at that Ferrari, I'm thinking, mm, gosh, well, I could spend the money, but there goes a lot of my income, almost a quarter of what's I got in the bank. So you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and finance that. I'm gonna put half the money down and finance the rest of that $75,000 or whatever the case is. Well, I'm not wealthy because you know what I had to do? I had to take out a loan because I didn't wanna make a big dent in my massive bank account, okay? That's a difference, that's being rich, okay? Lifestyle outspends long-term income. So oftentimes what you see is rich people were rich for a little while, but then suddenly something happened in their life where that income stopped coming in. And as a result, they are no longer rich. They may be well-to-do, they may be upper class, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily rich anymore. And they're certainly not wealthy. Let's look at wealth for an example now. Wealth isn't about the income that you make, but the accumulation of assets. Folks, please refer to your, your text, your reading on this and the films that I, I issued you, <coughs> asked you to watch the film because it's going to unpack this notion of rich and wealthy a little bit more, okay? So wealth has to do with the accumulation of assets, not how much money you make, how many things do you own? How many houses? How many pieces of a company do you own? Um, stock, okay, trades, bonds, um, collectible items, cars, all of these things. Wealthy folks are generally able to save about 15% or more of their total paycheck. They don't even have to touch it. They're already living off of a large amount of income and assets that they already own. So they just pop 15%. Imagine you out of every single paycheck automatically not even needing 50%, it just goes straight into a savings, right? And so as a result, when you're wealthy, assets are accrued via trading or selling of other assets. Let me make this break this down for you. When you are rich, you're buying the Lamborghini, the Ferrari, whatever the case is, financing half of it and paying cash with half, maybe if you're lucky. When you're wealthy and you want the Lamborghini, you maybe look over to a warehouse full of cars. Okay, I'm talking like Jay Leno status here, Adam Carolla status, where you're looking at cars and you're saying, you know what? I mean, I've got three 
of these Jaguars over here, right? I just really got them because I like the color and two of these are kind of rare. Um, and you go and you say, look, uh, to an auction, uh, how about the owner of the Ferrari? You know what? I can exchange with you uh, a couple of these cars if you're interested and we could just do a swap. And the other person says, cool, I love a Jaguar. How about we negotiate for that old Ford GT40 over there, right? And I'll give you my Ferrari for that. Now what's happened is no exchange of, of cash has taken hand. You have assets where now you don't even need to spend money all right, to accrue another high value asset. That's wealth. That's not being rich. Assets are invested and generate more income than your actual job. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but I'm going to give you an example of that, that the wealthy actually make more money, more money on money sitting in offshore accounts, in stocks, and in the value of properties and their cars that increase in value every single year because of that. They're that rare, right? That they make more in all of that than showing up and clocking into a business every single day. I know for some of us, that's almost like unfathomable to consider. I'm going to give you actual examples of that in the next few sides. Assets then are passed down or inherited and exist within multiple generations. If I was like Jay Leno, I'm not trying to sell off all my cars. I don't need to. I'm comfortable, right? And so what happens if I have a son, if I have a daughter, if I have um, whatever family members, my family inherits the collection, ergo, they also inherit the value of all of that. That means when I'm born into a family like the Kardashians or whatever the case is, I don't have to, I am born into instantly the wealth that my family collectively has accrued. The house is already bought. The warehouse of cars is already sitting there. The bank accounts are already full. I have done nothing to accrue the wealth, the power, the privileges that go along with that other than be, be born into that family. Lifestyle represents then part of the means. When you're rich, you're buying the, the uh, Gucci glasses, right? The amazing tailored suits. You're showing off the Tesla because you're saying, I've got money to purchase this now. Look at my income. When you are wealthy, you're saying, I buy these products because they're quality products, because they're comfortable, because they last a long time. You know what? I, I wear coach glasses because there was a sale on them and I picked up three or four, but I have a mountain of sunglasses, designer brand sitting in a room somewhere. So it's just what I felt like wearing. It was nice. It was a color. It matched my outfit. I don't need to go out and buy a new outfit. I've already got the assets to match. Okay. So this is the notion, the difference between rich and wealthy. The reason I'm making this distinguishing sort of slide for you here is because when I talk about the distribution of wealth and power, I didn't say the distribution of rich and power. I said the distribution of wealth and power in this country. Some people think that there's not a social problem that exists in our country because you have rich people of color, you have rich African-Americans, you have rich Latinos, you have rich individuals who have been marginalized. That's different. Rich is just placating. It's allowing people to feel like they're playing the game for a little bit of time, but that doesn't mean that those same individuals have the ability to accrue wealth in their lifetime. And we're gonna talk about that. So here's the harsh reality, right, of the distribution of wealth and power in our country. As you will see in your textbooks and the film that I give you, social mobility, the ability to move upward in terms of wealth, okay, in this country has remained stagnant for a number of years. In fact, the likelihood of persons moving up in the wealth distribution um, actually is lower in the United States than any other industrialized nation. The chance of you actually becoming wealthy in this country is lower than any other industrialized nation. Poor families are 10 times more likely to remain poor than to move into the highest income quintile. And those who start out rich are five times more likely to remain rich. Now, I didn't say wealthy, I said rich. So that's important to understand. Research tells us that from the 1980s to 2003, about three fourths of the responsibility for where an individual ends up in terms of their wealth, listen to this, is explained by the wealth of one's parents. That makes sense now, right? Because if you understand then that rich is different, wealthy is another, that when someone is born wealthy, all right, that means that they're gonna stay wealthy because it's not their wealth, it's the family's wealth. Everyone is entitled to those resources and builds upon that. 
So if three other family members who had their used the wealth, the riches, the, the money, the resources generated from their wealth to inherit uh, or to buy a business and now are, uh, accrue more wealth, right? Own another business that's worth something, buy more cars, more collectibles, more whatever, the wealth continues to build upon itself, okay? And you stay wealthy, you don't lose it. And so there's this notion then, if the, all this takes place, what this means then is that we're, and this is the scary thought, is that meritocracy doesn't mean as much in this country, perhaps as it used to. That the notion of being able to be whatever you want to be uh, is a little skewed. The fact of the matter is when someone tells you to, that when life gets hard, you just pick yourself up by your bootstraps, fails to recognize that there are some individuals who don't even wear any boots to grab any bootstraps with. They've been denied the ability to even have a shot at accruing wealth later in their life or in their, their, their children's lives. Okay. Maya Angelou had said, we have to confront ourselves. Do we like what we see in the mirror? And according to our light, according to our understanding, according to our courage, we will have to say yay or nay and rise. I spend this time thinking about this because as social workers, when you go out and challenge the macro systems at play regarding the distribution of wealth and power in this country, what you're asking people to do is let go of this concept of meritocracy. You're asking them to challenge then essentially the virtue and innocence of America. You're considering then, we're asking them to consider that in America, when it comes to the distribution of wealth and power, we have built a culture of cruelty all right, as Tim Wise would describe in his book, um, Under the Affluence, which I would strongly encourage you to check out too. <clears throat> we have built a culture of cruelty in how we treat others that are not wealthy in this country, in fact, that are poor. And there's intent at a systemic level to subjugate individuals to keep those poor, because the more people that are poor means the more resources can flow up to those that are wealthy. Let me give you examples of that. But I need you to understand that when you have these conversations with folks, um, this can be a scary thought because we've all been raised ingrained with those questions that I asked you at the beginning, right? Well, we've all been created equal. We all have a right to happiness, to pursue happiness. Hair of happiness is not guaranteed, right? And so there's a notion of, yeah, you can go and pursue it. Doesn't mean you're ever going to get it. That's a scary thought, right, for some people. Um, we're going to skip that one. Uh, let's, sorry about that. Let's move on to this slide here. Um, just for the sake of that. And we might visit that activity in um, residency. So I'd like to talk about then, I, I led us into a conversation down a bunny hole that fill, fits with this lecture, right? And the distribution of wealth and power that ties to another theoretical framework. Remember the overarching umbrella for today's lecture is thinking through theory, right? And I'd like to introduce another, another one to you called labeling theory, labeling theory. What labeling, labeling theory says is that the theory um, basically is a society creates deviance by identifying particular members as deviant, that we label individuals as less than or outside the, 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 the main margins of society. And when we label them as that, they become that. All right. Now that feeds into this notion of culture and cruelty uh, that I wanted to give you. Okay. So, um, although all of us think about this, I don't know if there's anyone in our cohort and certainly not me that can say that we've never sped right we've all we all speed generally right we all gone a little little over the speed limit right i know that's true i'm probably maybe i'm making an assumption here but i'm guessing all of us at some point have sped yet we don't beat each other up for that right we don't say you're a speeder right how bad for you or whatever the case is you're a bad person because you went five miles over the speed limit but we do tend to tell people well you're poor maybe you haven't worked hard enough maybe you just didn't go to school well, if you had worked harder in high school, if you had done better on your SATs, maybe you'd be in a better position now in life. What they fail to realize is the number one indicator for the highest SAT scores that you can get is not the school that you went to or even how hard you studied. It's if you can afford the most expensive tutor because that tutor is prepping you for how to do well on your SAT, not to relearn everything that you should have learned in high school. And so the reality is if you work two jobs, if your family works two jobs, if they're never home, if they can't afford a tutor, then you're stuck going into that SAT test uh, exam blind without the resources that other students have had. And so you are labeled as lazy or maybe even dumb or underprivileged 
because you didn't do well on your SAT scores when really the coding, the underlying language that exists, the red pill, the truth to the matter is you didn't have the same access to resources that another student did to successfully score higher, leading to all of those other opportunities as a result of their SAT scores. So I'd like to consider some food for thought on this. When did we develop content for the poor? When did we start to socially label the poor as worthless, dumb, lazy, unskilled, alcoholics, crack addicts? When do we label the poor as deviant, criminals, opportunistic, thieves, all of these? Now, some of you are saying, do we really call them that? Um, we not only call them that, we treat them that way. And I'm gonna give you some examples of that uh, in the next couple of slides. When do we undeserve, when do we, do we believe the poor are undeserving of things like television devices, certain foods or brands of clothing, right? If we see someone, I've worked with families who have lived in absolute poverty and they're wearing name brand clothes and those individuals, you walk into their home and they have a big screen TV on the wall, right? And they have an amazing sound system and a PS5, right? Or five is what's out now. So I'm saying five, but at the time I worked with them, it was the brand new PS4, right? And some people want to judge that and say, this family can barely afford food. Why do they have these nice clothes? Why do they have a TV? Why do they have a PS5? Why do they have Wi-Fi? Why do they have a cell phone? Not only that, a smartphone. What's important to understand here is that if you don't have money to vacation, the only escape that you have in a literally one bedroom apartment with eight people living in it is your entertainment. That's it. Because you're not going to Disneyland. <laughs> you're not even going to Castle Park right? You are stuck right there in that one bedroom apartment in Moreno Valley and you have nowhere else to go. So guess what? 50 bucks for a video game doesn't sound too bad because it's an escape from the craziness and chaos that is going on in my home on a daily basis. Maybe I spend a little more money on name brand clothes that maybe I get at the swap meet or other, or other means, okay? Because I don't want to feel like or look like what other people see me as every single day. And so it's important to understand then that what the underlying code, the red pill that individuals that live in poverty face every day is a constant judgment on how individuals spend their money. But think about this, when we judge someone that's poor for having a smart uh, smartphone, what we're saying is, is that we have a problem with you having a smartphone because we don't believe you deserve the smartphone. We don't believe you're worthy of having the smartphone. You didn't work for it the same way I did when we fail to realize that really the only thing that we need now, the major thing that we need, if you want to apply for a job, can you really walk into a store other than fast food now, right? And get a job in person. Many jobs, the only way you can apply, the only way you can get in to an HR representative is to filling out your resume and sending it online through calling, through searching for jobs online. We don't even do as many job searches through um, newspaper, right? Or circulars, or if any of you remember the penny saver, those don't even exist to the same degree they did before. If you want a job, you need a smartphone. Guess what? You also need Wi-Fi, but we condemn people for that. This notion isn't so far-fetched. Maybe you see here, let me move my face, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol that was written here. Did you actually know that this, this uh, the Christmas Carol that we love so much that we watch during the uh, holiday season, um, is actually was written, it was fictional, but Charles Dickens wrote it as an attack on how the poor were shamed in England during this time. Charles Dickens actually planned to write a, um, a nonfiction uh, critique on how the rich mistreated, shamed, abused the poor in England during his time, but he knew that it wouldn't be well received because it was too real. So what he did was he used Ebenezer Scrooge's character to represent wealth, not just rich, right? In English society and everything about um, Ebenezer Scrooge's comments about, you know, let the poor die and decrease the purpose, surplus population. They can go to the, the houses, the safe houses and all of this. Those were all structures that existed in England. And what happened was, is that when people saw this, what he was calling for was the wealthy to have a change of heart and how they treated the poor, the middle class, the common beings, the commoners of English society and change it to soften their hearts to stop the shaming and the abuse that took place. That was the origin of A Christmas Carol. So let me give you some examples currently of how we continue to be Ebenezer Scrooges and abusing and shaming the poor within our society, right? In San Francisco, 
the main Catholic church in San Francisco, Catholic church installed a sprinkler system to drench the homeless who were sleeping in the doorways of the church every single night. In Hawaii, state representative Tom Bauer smashed the carts of the homeless, the, 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 the carts, you know, the um, grocery carts they were going around with, of the homeless with a sledgehammer and told them to get out. Alaska Congressman Don Young suggested that if wolves were introduced into communities where they weren't currently to be found, those areas wouldn't have a homeless population anymore. These are actual words spoken, right? Attacks on the homeless are also becoming more brazen, including most recently the attack of a 58-year-old man in Ventura, California, who was set on fire by three young white men with shaved heads. Folks, uh, not only do we say and believe that the poor should be shamed or treated differently in our country, but we're treating them this way. Consider then the power of the systems that are at play here. This is a Catholic church, religion, playing a role in the oppression of the poor. These are representatives of Congress, right? And of systems, of political systems. So when we say that the distribution of wealth and power is a macro issue that has become institutionalized, we're talking about the faith-based institution in our political system mimicking role modeling, remember social learning theory, role modeling how we treat the poor in our society absolutely mind boggling, right? Let me tell you this about employment facts related to our country to talk about the macro concern, the 30,000 foot level on how wealth and poverty is a concern, not only for the individual, but for a macro issue that we need to combat as social workers. In 2015, 6.6 .6 million people stated they desired full-time employment, but they could not find it in this country. Latinos are about 60% more likely than whites to be unemployed in this country. African-Americans, are almost two and a half times as likely as whites to be out of work. Latinos and Latinas with a diploma have an unemployment rate more than 20% higher than those similar to whites. This is the statistics, the reality of a macro issue, not an individual issue, right? If a Latino or a Latina has a diploma and a person, non-person of color has a diploma and they go apply for the same job, all right, what we're talking about is 20% higher rate of the person of non-color, right, obtaining that job. Uh, Latino and a Latina, uh, college graduates are 50% more likely um, than um, comparable of, of white graduates to be out of work. Again, uh, staggering numbers, right, of the distribution of wealth and power. I wanna give you a little bit more because you're gonna read these in your text, but it's important to understand the power of this macro problem of the distribution of wealth, right, in our country and uh, falling in line with social labeling theory, how we treat the rich and the poor and why social mobility is stuck in this country. From 1997 to 2007, the richest 1% of Americans nearly quadrupled, quadrupled their average incomes. The middle three fifths of America, okay, only saw a 40% gain in average incomes during that time. That's less than 1.5%. Folks, working class folks, you, me, other individuals when we go to Walmart, right, that are, are working there, uh, other individuals that are even are working at Costco, Stater Brothers, whatever the case is, you can tell I'm hungry, I'm talking about food, right, um, only saw an income of 1.5%, while the richest 1% saw quadruple their income increase. In 2013, 165,000 Wall Street bankers took home an average bonus of $162,000 each. $27 billion going to bonuses for people on Wall Street. What could we do to solve poverty in this country with $27 billion? What could we do to address the needs? The fact of the matter is, um, let me see here. At the time I'm recording this lesson, it's just before New Year's, New Year's Eve, right? And what could we do with $27 billion to assist individuals who are homeless right now, right now due to losing jobs of COVID, who have massive medical bills because they've been in the hospital and being treated for COVID, who are late on their rent and facing eviction in the near future once this bill's done uh, related to COVID. What could we do with $27 billion? Hedge fund managers can make in one single hour of work what the average American family earns in 21 years. 
as of 2014, the 400 wealthiest Americans were worth $2.3 trillion. trillion. Think about the, the legislation we passed to bail people out in this country because they genuinely need help, a stimulus package of trillions of dollars. And look at what the 400 wealthiest Americans possess. And as of 2013, the wealthiest 30 people in the US own 792 billion worth of assets, which is the same amount of the poorest half of Americans, right? Let me hit you home with this really quick from 2011 to 2014, nine of the wealthiest people in America, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the two Kosh brothers and uh, four principal Walton heirs gained an average of over $13 billion from capital gains on pre-existing assets. Do you know what that means, folks? Remember what I said, when you're wealthy, you make more money on the assets that you own rather than the paycheck of showing up to work every day. Okay, they each made an average of $13 billion from what they already owned, not from working. They did not work more hours. They did not add a job. They did not invent anything new. The stuff they already owned became worth more on the stock market and made them more money than their own day-to-day -day jobs. Do you see how when I'm saying that the distribution of work, that the cards have been stacked, where if you're wealthy, you stay wealthy, and if you're poor, you're kept poor, exists in our country. This is not meritocracy. That's something different here, which you're going to read about and discuss in the films. I also like to point out the intersectionality of race and wealth, right? It's important to consider, too, that the majority of these individuals um, are Caucasian, essentially all. I think all of them are actually. And so when we consider race and wealth, we're also seeing a divide that is underpinned by race, right? In Bloomberg's daily ranking of the world's 500 richest people, the world's wealthiest three, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Jeff Bezos, all white American men have total net worth of 85 billion, 79 billion, and 73 billion respectively. Now take a look at this. By comparison, the 2015 gross domestic product of Sri Lanka meaning everything that Sri Lanka generated in income in 2015 was 82 billion, less than Bill Gates alone. Luxembourg was 58 billion, less than any of them, and Iceland, 16 billion. These individuals own more money, are worth more, Broad to avoid U.S. taxes to the tune of about $24 billion a year. Corporate companies can write off the expense Okay, I think we're still recording. Hopefully I didn't lose you. Zoom literally just shut out on me right now and I don't know what that was about. So I'm hoping that this, that we didn't lose all of that. So that's a little scary. Okay, so hopefully we didn't. I'm gonna check on the recording. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I'm telling you the technical difficulties are something else today, right? So um, banks were bailed out for stealing from customers. $800 billion banks received from the federal government. So a bank gets to rob its customers, take their homes, foreclose on them, and sell them. Not only do they make the profit from those homes, but they are bailed out by the federal government $800 billion for stealing from customers. And executives gave themselves bonuses with those governmental bailouts. So instead of executives giving them to homeowners or former homeowners that lost their homes and are living in cars and RVs parked in the streets in Rialto and Riverside and Redlands, instead they said, I'm going to give myself a bonus for the hard work that I did.
Freire writes and he poses the question, hint, hint, this is gonna potentially be on your quiz, right? So how can the oppressed and as divided and authentic beings participate in the pedagogy of their liberation? And as Freire describes, this then is the great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed to liberate themselves as well as the oppressors. Um, the oppressors become slaves to this language, to this money, um, to the notion of treating individuals less than, of robbing individuals of their dignity and their well being and their ability to provide for themselves and their family, right? So uh, this is important to understand, right? Um, Finally, what I want to do is I want to leave us there with that. I hope that this was helpful in at least connecting, if you will, um, the notion of theory to practice. So we talked about, just to recap, social learning theory. We talked about social exchange theory. We talked about capital or social capital. And we talked about social labeling theory. I wanted to draw in on those to give you real examples while also deepening our understanding of the distribution of wealth and power as a macro issue that we need to address um, as social workers, right, with good reason. So I hope, I hope you found that um, helpful. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close us out with our um, centering for today. I'm just bringing up my timer for us. I want to say thank you so much for all of you continuing to engage in the material. Um, I hope you found the lesson uh, helpful, okay? So let me go ahead and bring up our centering scripture and verse for today. Um, centering verse will come to us from 2 Corinthians, all right, chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, right? And, and we'll use the word liberty today. So we've been talking about oppression. You've been reading about the pedagogy of the oppressed. You've been reading about and understanding more through lecture, the absolutely powerful and staggering ways, right? That racism um, and even classism has become institutionalized in our country. Uh, and I'm starting to give you the tools now to combat that, right? So each lecture moving forward, I'm gonna give you more tools to combat um, these social problems. I gave you the theory now, and then we're gonna dive further into uh, other actual strategies you can use as a social worker to begin to rally the community, empower the community, uh, the oppressor, the oppress, uh, the oppressed, right, to not only liberate themselves, but to liberate the oppressors. And so we'll go with liberty today. So uh, I'd like you to go ahead and make sure your hands and feet are in a nice, comfortable position. At this point in the semester, I think sometimes it gets a little heavy. You're having assignments due, you have exams for this class, you have papers and proposals that you're working on, and I know things can feel heavy. Um, but I also want you to understand you, you, you survived through the first semester. You not only survived, you thrived. You guys have been doing amazing. The first semester, we were awed by your engagement um, and your enthusiasm for learning. So you can get through this. You will get through this, okay? Um, just keep persisting. Go ahead and take a nice deep breath. Allow Christ into your heart to speak to liberty, to speak to now the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Take a nice deep breath, close your eyes, and I will keep track of the time.
Okay, go ahead and take that nice deep breath. Open your eyes. Welcome back. Uh, folks, it has been an absolute pleasure. Again, spending time sharing uh, this information with you. I'm gonna see you all soon-ish, right? Soon-ish meeting in the next lecture. And then of course, if any of you need to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. Know that I'm praying for you. Please check Blackboard. Um, for your upcoming assignments uh, and due dates. And of course, if you need anything after that, reach out to me, I'll get back to you. Thank you all so very much for your time. Um, I look forward to our next lecture together and I will see you all soon. Take care, thank you.